Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fifth in our series of webinars on Big Data, XMODEL, and System Dynamics. Today we have the pleasure of listening to an old good friend of mine, Andy Ford, and he's uh, been working in System Dynamics and Electric Utilities for many, many years, and actually we're going to have the pleasure of seeing two stories, one from quite a while ago and one from very recently, both related to the use of System Dynamics modeling and looking at how to work with uh, Electric, electric utility generation, um, both from the perspective of the people running the, the companies and from the perspective of the people using the power. So um, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Andy Ford to talk about energy market dynamics transforming the electric power industry. Thank you, Bob. I'm going to hit the show my screen button and hopefully everybody's connected and off we go. Um, my name is uh, Andy Ford. I'm professor at the School of Environment at WSU. And this is a picture of my website. And I do my research on energy issues. And the two stories I'm going to tell today are documented in energy publications that you can download from my uh, university website. The case studies involve uh, transformative resources. And the examples are conservation and energy storage. The conservation drawing is from the Pacific Northwest where it depicts the western, the northwestern states all wrapped in insulation and the dramatic feature of that insulation is who paid for it. The homeowner didn't buy it, the utilities bought it, basically 80 to 90 percent of it and they did it for good financial reasons which, which system dynamics helped illuminate. The other case will be uh, energy storage. The example depicted is compressed air where you pump air into a cavern to store the energy in that air and then you release the air to generate electricity. So I'll start with the older story first. It, it emerged from the 1970s. I was a doctoral student at that time and when I read the papers it told stories of power companies immersed in the energy crisis and they face great financial challenges of building new power plants. They had a history in the industry of building bigger and bigger plants to take advantage of economies of scale. Um, they were, it, some utilities were building 3,000 megawatt power plants and they were discovering that bigger was no longer the answer to their problems. And I'm going to show you using system dynamics uh, stocks and flows what they faced I'll begin with the, what they called the golden years, the 1960s. And they were typically building plants that took five years to build. Their forecast of future needs would extend five years into the future. And this example, the utility thinks it will need 14 gigawatts. It has 10. It puts four gigawatts under construction. And when you count up the construction work in progress and the assets, it's quite a burden. You've got to finance three billion with $10 billion company, but they could do it. But recall that utilities have monopoly privilege and for that they are subject to rate of, turn, rate of return regulation. So they could finance this challenge in the 60s. In the 70s, the big difference was that these power plants were not just more extensive, but they took longer to build. And with a 10-year forecast and growth at 7% a year, you'll need twice as much capacity as you have now. And in this situation, they were straining to put the capacity under construction. And financially, they would be a $10 billion company trying to finance $10 billion in construction. And despite rate of return regulation, they weren't able to do it. Here's a headline from 1979 a dark future for the utilities, caught in a spiral of uncertainties, the energy crisis, regulation and inflation, and money is harder than ever to find. The answer, they thought, was to press their regulators for higher rates, and the regulators responded with many rate increases, but it just wasn't working out. There was a vicious circle that utilities can't seem to break. The subtitle is, New Plants Are Forcing Rate Increases, further cutting the growth in demand. And when demand falls, the utility revenues fall, and their financial indicators can fall, and they're back asking for more rates. This particular dilemma was sometimes called the death spiral. 
This is a picture from a planning council in the northwest. And it, the way you're supposed to read this uh, snail shell diagram is that higher costs lead to higher rates, lead to lower sales, lead to lower revenues. Oh, we have to raise rates again. That depresses sales again. Revenues are still lower. Rates have to go up. Sales go down. And it looks like you're going to wash the utility right down the drain. This, this vicious circle was in all the headlines, and utilities were wondering what to do about it. Now, for people in the system dynamics community, a, a vicious circle is a positive feedback loop that works against the interests of the managers. And on the right side, you have the uh, way it works for a regulated company. They have allowed revenues based on the rules of the commission. And if the electricity consumption were to go up, the indicated price can go down. Now, in this situation, the indicated price was going higher and higher. After a lag, actual prices went higher, driving electricity consumption down, which meant we have to ask for yet another rate increase and see still higher rates, still lower electricity consumption. That's the so-called death spiral. Now, it is embedded in a larger system. The utilities look at energy consumption, then forecast the need for future capacity, and they have a mandate to serve. So they start construction, and after a very long delay during this time period, completions come online, installed capacity is up, and the capacity expansion loop is a goal-seeking loop that tries to have an adequate level of capacity. Notice this is a need to serve. This is not a profit motive. It's an obligation to get installed capacity to an adequate level. When installed capacity goes up, the so-called rate base goes up, allowed revenues goes up, and there's yet another feedback loop in this system. I'm going to pause here for a second. Kareem, do you see any questions on the webinar screen? Well, let me um, just remind everyone that you can type questions in the um, area at the bottom that um, it's on the bottom right of your panel. There's a question area where you can type questions if you have them. Um, at this point, there are no questions from the audience, but I, I'm curious, um, when, I, I know you're going to, to suggest something where, um, where they're not going to need to build as much capacity, are you going to address whether they've then built smaller plants or something, or, or how do they get around? Yeah, you bet. Um, smaller plants is what caught my interest and one of the reasons why I did this study, and sure enough, they'll be part of the solution. Um, it's, what I want to share with you next is, is um, not just what I did, but what electric power companies did to simulate the death spiral. And um, a power company will have modelers in every nook and corner of the company. There will be hundreds of them organized functionally in different departments, and they will have command of a whole broad variety of methods. Sadly, system dynamics is often absent from their portfolio. So what, what I want to show you is what these power companies would do to simulate the death spiral. They typically would start with a model of electricity demand broken down into residential, commercial, industrial, agricultural. It was quite detailed models, many of them statistical. They start with a price input maybe 20 years into the future, and they would forecast low growth. The vice president for forecasting would sign off that, yep, that's our official forecast. It would then be fed to the people who know how to do capacity expansion, often in an optimal way, and they would yield suggested capacity starts. Perhaps they'll start five or six coal plants in the next six or seven years. The signature would go at the bottom line. The accountants would receive that forecast, run their cost models, calculate the price of electricity needed to recover their costs, and the whole cycle would be done, except for the little minor problem at the end the price coming out doesn't match the price going in. At this point, many utilities would say, oh, don't worry about it. That's just a little glitch. Let's get on with, with our decisions. Other people recognize that there's a fundamental problem here. Basically, the whole results are inconsistent, and so they would guess a new starting price, repeat the whole process until they got agreement, 
seldom did they find agreement. And if they ever once got these results to be internally consistent, it was only for their base case. And the problem here is that they don't know how to simulate the best viral. Um, now, I've depicted this problem with three models, but a big utility would have 33 models, and each model would have a staff of 10 or more people, bright people, especially those in charge. And we're talking about over 300 modelers in large companies. And these are companies that I visited and knew pretty well, and I respected them. So I'm not picking the bottom of the barrel to show this example. I'm picking top companies. And I remember most vividly the corporate planner at one of these companies saying after his 300 or so modelers couldn't tell him what he needed to know. He said, can't someone simulate the death spiral? So what utilities did next was say, we don't need 33 models. Let's build one single model. They call these corporate models. And what we learned in a workshop by EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute, only one of the 12 models did the spiral. I ran a workshop for the Department of Energy. There were 13 participants. Only one of the 13 did the spiral. It happened to be the model I built using system dynamics. And in the EPRI workshop, it happened to be a model by what was called then Pew Roberts Associates. It was the only one that did system dynamics. Absent system dynamics, managers had to simulate the spiral in their head. And basically, vicious circles and delays and nonlinearities are beyond our cognitive abilities, and managers could sort of sense that. They felt helpless facing these conditions. My own conclusions were that um, what was being pressed on regulators wouldn't solve the problems. Every, the companies were saying the regulators are at fault. They should simply raise rates, and the simulation showed that wouldn't solve the financial problems. Building smaller, short lead time plants was a solution. Um, at my position at the National Laboratory in Los Alamos, we conducted a major study of building small. And small plants with shorter lead times would help a utility tremendously. They shorten the forecasting interval, and therefore the burden you have to put under construction. And the ultimate answer is to slow the growth in electricity demand, and you can do it by actively intervening on the demand side through efficiency programs. And in the 80s, there was a move to small scale and conservation programs for many utilities. I did a lot of work for Bonneville, which was a leader in conservation. And they would go house to house doing retrofit in, uh, programs. And believe it or not, they would pick up 75 to 80 percent of the costs of the measures. And it was good business for them and good for their customers. Conservation truly was a transformative resource back then, and it still is today. It's often the best resource utility planners turn to today. And system dynamics help people discover the power of conservation during this time period. I'm going to turn now to a more recent case. It's energy storage. The most familiar form of storage is called pumped hydro, where you pump water up into an uphill reservoir. When you need the electricity generation, you drop it back down. It spins the turbines. In this depiction, air is being pumped into a cavern that creates load on this system. So you raise, say, nighttime load. You release the air during the day when electricity is more valuable. And interestingly, in this depiction, there's a wind machine in the picture, and that's no accident. Promoters of storage often say that it will be the holy grail for renewables. Proposals are exploding around the country, around North America, for more storage. But the problem that the promoters have is they, they have a trouble justifying the value. A dozen or more modes of value can be described, like let's, let's do load leveling. We'll raise the load at night, and we'll lower the load during the middle of the day. These modes can be described, but they're seldom quantified. The few attempts to quantify value usually show value at less than half the cost of new storage. Our focus for this study will be the value of fuel-free compressed air storage on the Ontario power system. By fuel-free, we mean you pump the air into a cavern, 
when you release it, you control the thermodynamics in an advanced method that is isothermal. And this means you can generate electricity without having to burn any fuel like natural gas. The Ontario power system is centered in Toronto, Ontario. And it's one of the larger power systems in Canada. Now I'm going to show you a view of a Benson model that looks out at the long term, starts in this year, goes to the year 2043. The facility would start uh, a few years in the future and run for 20 years and less the long time horizon. The, the stack generation in the peak hour is shown with resources. Red, blue is the hydro and combined heat and power. Uh, that's the uh, like steam heating. Red is the wind, which is slated to grow dramatically in Ontario. Nuclear is in purple. They have a large nuclear fleet now, but it will need refurbishment, and the drop in the purple stack is due to that refurbishment period. Get coal is being phased out in Ontario. This is quite a dramatic step. In the U.S., we rely previously for about 50% of our energy from coal. It's declined recently with cheaper gas, and we all are debating whether at the EPA there will be restrictions on coal. In Ontario, they took this step several years ago, and they basically said no more coal, and the black lines are disappearing at the beginning of the simulation. Gas is taking up the slack for the loss of coal and the drop in nuclear. And this is a typical long-term model of a system and it reminds people of what are called integrated resource planning models. Now what we decided to do as the project got underway is we, we built both a long-term model and an operational model. And what the operational model does is it simulates a typical week one hour at a time. It gets its loads and capacities from the long-term model. It shows wind generation with more uh, accuracy and then the results from what we do are passed upward to the long-term model. For example, the performance of storage in dealing with the wind. So I'm going to show you these two models working in concert. I've returned to the long-term model and what you should see concentrate on is the wind in red. It varies seasonally and thus the bouncing up and down in the wind generation. For example, August is a low wind month in Ontario. Now, watch this change of perspective. This is wind in the short-term model using actual historical capacity factors. And what you see is a very windy Thursday. When you stack the nuclear on top, which is must run, you'll see a lot of orange. And orange is the sum of exports and possibly curtailments. And if you go to this view, you can see that in Thursday, there will be heavy exports in blue. And when they fill the transmission lines, you'll be forced to do curtailments in red. Now, curtailments mean that must-run units are being shut down. And typically, they are must-run, must-pay. So that's expensive and embarrassing to the system. And the reason it happened on Thursday was it was a windy Thursday. Now, one of the things you might do is pump energy into the storage to provide reduction in those curtailments. When you see them coming, you turn on the pumps, and that adds load to the system. And then later, you can generate to um, put that energy back to use. The most familiar form of using energy storage is to do load leveling. You pump at night, and you generate during the day. And in the process, you make the load look more level. And this pattern is called energy arbitrage. So I'm going to show you an example of the weekly model running in a load leveling mode. We asked for 1,000 megawatts of storage to be used as a load leveler. And let me just show you a little bit more before I ask questions. The storage itself is in blue. It's jumping during at night, dropping in the, when you generate refilling at night, dropping when you generate. And the megawatts going in and out of storage are in red and purple. The loads and generation are in red and purple on the second graph. And you can verify that this is sustainable. 
and then you can study its value in the long-term model. But before I do that, let me pause and ask Kareem if there's any questions that have arrived. Hi, Andy. Yes, there have been a couple of questions that were on the last um, part of this, the first part. Um, if you're willing to take a couple of those. Sure. Um, so one of the questions was, um, how is the trend of smart grid taken into account? I mean, this was this was a, an older uh, model, right? So, But they're talking about the current smart grid to manage the demand to calibrate the supply. So the smart grid is a very hot topic recently. And the use of storage to deal with load leveling and other modes of value is deeply embedded with the smart grid. So in Ontario, all the key people who are talking storage are the members of a smart grid consortium where people talk about the best ways to use the smart grid. And so I would say that the smart grid is deeply embedded in the current case study of storage. As for the old case of conservation, the programs that were massively funded and very successful were, you didn't need to be smart. Uh, any, uh, well, I, I don't want to say a stupid person, but any person who isn't very smart can look at the, a leaky home, see all the measures that could make that home more efficient, fork over 80% of the costs, and everybody benefited. And uh, the savings were so obvious to waiting to be had what was complicated was demonstrating the value to the utility company from a financial perspective of jumping in and making it happen. So stay tuned for the rest of the storage story. Great. Um, some people are asking um, what it means to, what's a system dynamics model? What it means, help me out Kareem, can you elaborate more? <laughs> Uh, so they're, they're just, they've just heard the term and they're not quite sure what it means. So in general, it's a, it's a model that incorporates feedback, would you say, in particular, and looks at behavior over time? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, one, what a system dynamics means to me is uh, that there are stocks and flows, and they are the basic building blocks. And so the best example was that big box called energy and storage that was a stock. And those arrows called a pump energy into the cavern for curtailments, that was a flow. And Kareem's absolutely right about the feedback. It's a distinctive feature to simulate the feedback loops I showed you. And what is very revealing is that other groups ignore the feedbacks. Um, what, what I've noticed most is groups that don't use system dynamics may simulate a lot of what you might call little loops that just control little things in your system. Um, but the big loops that require interdisciplinary analysis often are neglected. And I would say those, along with uh, really a powerful software that's dramatically easy to use, distinguish system dynamics from other methods. Great. And someone else, uh, Wayne Wakeland, added for us that um, the model creates an endogenous explanation for the behavior of the system rather than exogenous explanation. I have another question here. Um, someone said they don't understand um, the concept of how energy can be stored and pumped. And they're concerned about so, limits of capacity. So that's a good concern. Uh, what will happen is the capacity is the size of the pumps. These pumps are reversible. So in our case we're going to study a 1,000 megawatt facility and that means it can put 1,000 megawatts of load on the system at night when you're pumping, and you can get 1,000 megawatts of generation when the, when, the, when the air is released from the cavern. The other limit is how much energy can be stored in the cavern. That's usually measured in hours of the generators running before you drain the cavern. And in the storage examples that are most familiar, like pumped hydro and compressed air, that's called bulk storage. There's a whole realm of other storage devices that have much smaller amounts stored, but they can react faster. And examples include flywheels and batteries. 
So I'm looking at what's called bulk storage. Lots of capacity, lots of hours worth of energy stuck away in a cavern or stuck in a reservoir. Great. And, and just one last question before we go on. Is all the energy produced from high wind days stored or is some of it blown off? The, um, the phrase blown off reminds me of a phrase called feathering the wind, which is another phrase for curtailing the generation from wind. And if you can't store the energy because your cavern is full and you can't use it either locally or to sell to your neighbors, you have to curtail it. And if you choose to curtail wind, you just feather the device. Um, you, there's talk of curtailing nuclear generation, which is a must-run facility. Curtailments are difficult and expensive to do, uh, and you lose the generation from the device being curtailed, and they are a huge embarrassment to the power system. It finds itself with too much generation uh, and insufficient load. Great, thank you. I think this is a good time to move on to the rest okay. of it. Thank you. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm going to do now is I left the domain of the weekly model that runs uh, one hour at a time, and I've gone back to the long-term model, which runs in months. And I'm looking at a typical day in each month in the long-term model. And I want you to see the, the amount of money that passes back and forth to the Ontario Power Authority. The graph on the left shows total annual payments to the generators. Hydro is in blue, hydro and uh, combined heat and power. Red is the payments to wind generators. They have one of the best fixed feed and tariff programs in, in the world. It's, Ontario is often praised for their tariff program. It's, it's put on a par with the excellent programs in Germany, for example. So they, these are major payments to the wind generators. Major payments to nuclear in purple, to gas in orange. The conservation programs are their best resource, but in terms of total spending, it's a modest amount. They're shown in orange. And then they get back money from generators based on spot market revenues. These are shown to the right. The spot market has a surge in prices during the refurbishment of the nuclear units. And what on OPA has to do is raise money to recover the difference between the money spent on the left and the money received on the right. And when they set that price, it sets the price of electricity to the local distribution companies. And what we choose as a figure of merit is can we reduce the cumulative cost of power to those companies? And I'll show you a test of the storage facility. We asked for a 1,000 megawatt facility. We put it to use in load leveling. We, we draw up the, the standard efficiency, which is a middle. We have low, medium, and high efficiencies. We've been very thorough checking out when to do the pumping, so we adopt smart pumping. And we do the load leveling only in the peak months, December, January, February, and August. We hit the run button. Oops, I forgot about the combustion turbines. You can take a capacity credit if you're providing 1,000 megawatts. And so these two sliders were used to reduce 1,000 megawatts of new combustion turbine additions. Then we hit the run button, and the cost to the local distribution companies dropped by $2 billion. And that's our figure of merit. Two billion is a lot of money, but it's less than half the cost of a new facility. When I first saw that, I thought, oh dear, there's something wrong. But the team and the agencies that reviewed the work said, no, no, that's what we expect as well. And indeed, that small estimate of value built confidence in the model, but left us wondering, where is the value of storage? And it is in the wind. Whenever you see storage being developed, you'll inevitably see a picture of a windmill because it's in the wind that will find the, the challenges and the value of storage. When the wind blows, it can be highly variable, but people are getting quite good at forecasting how much generation you'll get, but inevitably there are errors in the forecast. And what I'm showing here in this depiction is a huge wind fleet that can give you 10,000 megawatts of power one moment and less than 1,000 the next moment. 
And in this part of the, the uh, week, the wind is lower than the forecast. The forecast is in red. And when the wind is low, you've got to make up that difference because the whole system is being planned on that forecast. And what you do is you run the generators at the storage facility. On other hours, the wind is too high and you need more load. And the way you get that extra load is you run the pumps at the storage facility. And that is what we mean by integrating the wind with GCASE, General Compression Advanced Energy Storage. So we test out how effective the storage can be. Um, in this run, I'm using 1,000 megawatts of storage in a uh, January 2028 situation with a lot of wind, over 12,000, and the generators are being run in red, the pumps are being run in blue, and the end result, we can integrate 90% of the wind with that one facility. Now, the question is, how valuable is it to perform this service? And I have three curves here taken from a whole variety of studies in the western United States, and they show as the wind capacity gets larger and larger, it will be more costly to do this integration. That $6 number is a current posted rate at Bonneville Power for wind integration services. And this allows people to do sensitivity testing with three different choices for the value of wind integration. So we run the long-term model. I've picked the middle of the three curves. And I've said, I want to use this facility for wind integration. And I hit the Run button. And the total value of doing this service is $5.1 billion. And we're doing it in some months of the year. And we're running the facility as a load level or the other months. So we can add these values. And the total value number, which was the focus of our work, is $7 billion for a multiple use facility shown here in the middle. And $7 billion is substantial value. Indeed, it meets or exceeds the cost of a new facility. I'll conclude with future plans in Ontario. The, um, the long-term model, uh, has we, we've briefed uh, about a dozen different groups, sometimes multiple times, and the key stakeholders have shown great interest in continuing to help expand and improve the model. The short-term model will be useful in the future as an operations model, we'll be expanding it to explore still further ways to use storage. And as for storage, by the way, just to let you know, this was not an academic group to call for this study. This was an entrepreneurial group called NR Store, based in Toronto, that is pursuing multiple options for storage. And they wanted to make a strong case for value. And indeed, we succeeded. And the result, in the immediate term is that the Ministry of Energy will include storage in their acquisition process and they'll be starting with a small demo facility by 2014. Now for the system dynamics community in general, my advice from this study is to think about this combination of a long-term model and a short-term model. Um, it seems to me in every study I've been involved with there are short-term dynamics and long-term dynamics, and the group has to make a choice. And often we'll pick one choice or another and say, maybe we'll get around to the other model, but we never do. Um, in this particular study, we started with the long-term planning model. And about halfway through, I built this operational model that did one week at a time. And our discussions just blossomed at that point because there were so many topics that involved minute by minute, hour by hour dynamics, and we were simulating them and putting them in context of the long-term plan. We Suddenly we were learning a whole lot more from each other, and when we discussed the results with Ontario planning agencies, the group learning was magnified by having two models rather than one, and they were linked by they weren't linked com by the computer. They were linked by us thinking about what we learned and creating performance curves that would make one model benefit from the other. And with that, I will thank you for your attention and open the floor for discussion. Um, 
Thanks, Andy. That was great. We have a few questions about, there seems to be concern about energy loss when um, you pump it and then anything that might get lost while it's in storage and then energy loss coming out and how that's accounted for and what the effects might be. That's a good question. Storage typically has losses of 30, 40 percent. Um, the compressed air facility is advanced storage and it, its actual efficiency is still uncertain. So we have low, medium, and high estimates of the uncertainty. When we, we test the model uh, in the short term to make sure that it can be operated in a sustainable way, that means you do more hours of pumping at night than you receive hours of generating during the day. And what we found when we do the sensitivity test is that the efficiency choice is one of the least important parameters in this system. Um, so a systems model can put an individual feature like the uh, losses of a storage facility in a perspective. And what we learned was uh, when we had the larger perspective is that particular issue wasn't important in the Ontario case study. Great, thank you. We have a couple of questions also back, way back in the first part where you had the uh, death spiral loop and you had something called indicated price. Um, there's a question about what that is, how that gets set, who sets it, what does it mean? So the way the regulators work is they set an allowed revenue requirement and the standard phrase they use is to get the utilities uh, rate base, basically their assets exclusive of construction work in progress. And then they allow returns, perhaps they allow 10% return on the so-called rate base. And the allowed revenues include the cost of fuels and employees. And then in order to um, generate those revenues, you divide the allowed revenues by the electricity sales and you get the indicated price. Now, they don't just immediately update the price. They've got to think about it. There's lags to collect the data. There's lags to hold hearings. and um, it may be 12 months or 18 months before they raise the price. When the death spiral started uh, hitting hard, they automated the pass-through of certain costs to try to shorten the delay around that, uh, to shorten the lag between the indicated price and the actual price. Great, thank you. And there are a few questions here about how you combine the short-term model with the long-term model. Are you actually? So the key there is to learn from the uh, from the short term model. So for example, um, wind integration was a big issue, and so we would perform multiple simulations uh, for different years, and we would do all twelve months, and we would discover that with higher and higher capacity, the percent integration would go down and we would summarize that with performance curves, and those would go into the long-term model as nonlinear relationships that were looked up in a lookup function. Similarly, we would run the short-term model to look at how to operate the storage for hourly pumping and generating to make sure we could do it in a sustainable way, accounting for losses. And when we found a good pattern, we would put those pumping parameters into the long-term model. And then going in the other direction, when we were testing a typical year, we transferred down to the short-term model assumptions about monthly loads, capacities, muster end generation, and so forth. So the handoff was, um, was manual, and it took a lot of thought. Uh, but that thinking educated us all more about the Ontario power system. Great, thank you. So People are wondering if the building blocks were the same in both the long-term and the short-term model? Uh, no, they were quite different. So let me show a specific example of a building block in the, um, the short-term model. The short-term model has storage as a building block because we were keeping track of the rise and fall of the storage over time. So there's a stock that would um, you know, build up during the uh, nighttime hours and be drained down during the early hours, uh, during the evening hours. 
A typical stock in the long-term model were things that change more slowly, like uh, there's a major nuclear refurbishment project, and a box like this might hold the um, amount of nuclear capacity at, at a major facility like Darlington that is in service, and then be another stock for the amount that's in refurbishment. So they, the stocks and flows look very different from one model to the other. Great, thank you. Although this is a different scenario, do you see leveraging this type of storage, in other words, excess of demand, helping, being able to help somehow the uh, current water drought problems in the western U.S. or how it might relate to the, that? Oh boy, isn't that an interesting... <laughs> um, I have, I'm going to recommend that everybody who's interested in the intersection of water and electricity to read the recently completed doctoral thesis of Bobby Jeffers. Um, he's come to several system damage conferences, so some of you may know him. And he did his work for uh, a little bit further to the east, the, the Snake River Plain. But the, the water storage issues are crucial in California at the moment, and the huge amount of storage are in the groundwater storage and in the reservoirs as well. And for those of you who have read about water in California, I think the best reading is Cadillac Desert, and the place where major cuts can occur are in the use of water for irrigation. Um, energy storage, I don't think, will be helpful in California solving the, uh, the, the current water challenge. Great, thank you. Someone asks if you're aware of any uh, storage solution that could be used by homeowners, a small capacity storage systems that are relatively inexpensive. Um, the homeowners can benefit from storage solutions, but, but the, the examples I've heard are often inventive ideas from the utility. So I'm going to mention Bobby Jeffers' work here again because he did something really, really clever. One of his ideas is that the water in your water heater has thermal energy content, and if you could, um, if you need to to lower the load during key hours, you might shut down the signal to uh, say X percent of the home's water heaters, and then uh, later you when you when electricity is not as dear, you can resume the signal and your water heater. Uh, element will, will fire up and stay on longer. And what Bobby studied was an automatic control mechanism, and he tested it out for the island of Hawaii. And the way the homeowner participates is they get a visit from the power company saying, would you be willing to have a, a stack this thing onto your water heater, and you receive lower rates. And people say, yeah, that's great. And and because the mechanism times the interruption of the energy to not drain the energy content of your water heater, your performance is relatively the same. So there's, there's a clever device that involves the entire system and the homeowner benefits, uh, but the homeowner didn't invent the device. I have heard in developing countries of uh, devices where the homeowner uses storage in a clever way to keep the lights on, to keep um, self-generation lighting on longer at night. But for the life of me, I can't remember the article. But this was a small, uh, appropriate technology device. It's something like just a weight on a string, and it was able to allow people who were generating their own electricity in a small village to keep a light on at night so they could read later in the evening. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Bobby Jeffers is actually on here, and he's allowed us to share his email address for people with questions for him later. We'll send that in our follow-up uh, follow message that we send later. Um, there's a question here about, have you tried to apply these methods for hydro where uh, for example, in Ontario, because power generation can be higher in the spring uh, when demand is low? 
That's a that's a good question. Ontario uh, does have a large amount of hydro, and they use the storage in that hydro to perform um, ancillary services now. One of which is wind integration, and one of the key questions in hydro powered systems is how much flexibility do they have before they run out of it. Um, in an area that uh, Bobby and I both know well, the Idaho Power Company, they have a lot of storage facilities in this in the um, on the Snake River in the uh, in the Big Canyon, Hell's Canyon, and they're just running out of the capability of using that storage to provide reserves. Bonneville Power, which runs a huge store uh, hydro system, has a similar problem. Um, and so utilities with large hydro resources are used to optimizing those resources with their own models. And what they're discovering is they're just running out of the capability to be resilient. And so extra storage uh, is needed. The proposals for extra pump storage around the, the U.S. are exploding at the moment. And indeed, in the Northwest, where, where I live much of the year, the proposals for pump storage in Idaho, Oregon, and Washington would triple the pump storage capacity in the entire western United States. And these would be typically uh, on major rivers, pumping the water up, uphill, and then dropping it down when you need extra generation. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just going to take one last question here, which is, what were the extra added? What was the extra added value or insights that came from using system dynamics in this particular, in the storage model in particular, compared to other modeling methods? Well, for the for the storage study, what was distinctive is actually very similar to what was distinctive in the conservation study. Ontario has a huge number of talented people building complicated models, but they don't integrate together. And what we were doing was a systems level view that tied all the pieces together. And through the rapid repeating of simulations with FinSim and synthetic simulation, we got results flashing into view immediately. That prompted active discussion. And what was distinctive is everybody in the room was coming up with ideas and, you know, make this part better and this part looks great. And that conversation was unique. And it was the systems view that permitted that uh, group learning to occur. Thank you, Andy. I just wanted to point out very quickly that um, this series is brought to you by the XML Technical Committee. And we're trying to develop a standard for uh, system dynamics models for representing them. Within OASIS, this is the link if you want to help us. and. Um, if Steve's here, I would like him to do the wrap up. Steve, see, can you? Is your phone working? We unmuted you, Steve. Um, it says you're muted yourself. Okay, slight technical difficulty. Um, thank you for joining us today on this um, fifth in the series, our fourth presentation. Um, please join us again next time. will be March 4th, which is a Tuesday, three weeks from today, where um, the people at the ALSIS group will talk to us about how they use modeling to do regional planning across a, uh, well, across Alberta, but also they do it in Australia, the U.S., and other places that they list down below. Um, this is a very interesting application where they take um, lumped parameter model and they turn it into a uh, spatial representation of what's happening across the landscape. We look forward to seeing you then. Thanks again for joining us, and have a great day.